I work on the RGS API for Python team, and this is. And I'm Greg Brunner. I work for Esri's professional services team out in St. Louis. Uh, today we are going to talk about imagery and accessing and working with imagery, playing with imagery uh, in Jupyter Notebooks and using RGS API for Python. Uh, briefly, this is what we'll be talking about today. We'll cover some basics, fundamentals about raster information model, differences between local layer, web layer, what are raster types, clarify some other terminology. Um, we'll get a little bit detailed into raster functions, and that's what we'll be spending a lot of time on today. We'll touch upon distributed processing, delayed processing, some of the benefits of using imagery layers, imagery in RGIS and raster functions. And then it's going to be demo heavy. We're going to show you a lot of demos uh, working with Jupyter Notebooks, Python API, and imagery layers. Uh, so what are these? Um, this is the conceptual model how imagery is represented in RGIS. You have a raster data set that represents all your image data. And then you've got to understand a few different key terms when you want to work with imagery layers or raster data sets. There's a raster format which kind of refers to how data is being written to disk. Is it band interleaved or band interleaved by pixel or by line? Um, what is the cell depth? And what are the number of rows and number of columns and such kind of things. And then there's a raster type, um, which is a logic that is based by a particular sensor type. Uh, it, could be, it could be pulling information from metadata, such as what is the georeferencing that needs to be applied before it is displayed on the, displayed on the map frame, et cetera. And then there are raster functions, and these are very lightweight uh, pixel level processing that is executed on demand, only on the pixels that are shown on your screen. We'll be talking a lot more about how this works behind the scenes. Um, and then there are raster products. These are uh, representational items that you see in the user interface. And it pulls information based on what kind of sensor it is. It could be a Landsat data set, it could be a Sentinel imagery, it could be a radar set imagery. And then when you draw, it, it, it identifies what your sensor type is and it represents as a raster type. It is not something on the disk, it's just a representational item. And then there's a mosaic data set which acts like a catalog of all the different imageries that you would have for a particular project set. So what is important here is all of these that we just spoke about are uh, local rasters, local data sets that you would have on disk. But what we are going to work on is image service. This is when you publish it onto a server and you serve it out as a service. Our image service can be considered analogous to the raster data set. And you get all of these functionalities also within an image service. When we use the Python API today in today's talk, we'll be making use of these image services for the rest of our talk. Um, let's talk a little bit about raster processing. I'm going to fix a little bit of error I have in this slide, which is, let's call it raster functions. And that's the topic we have today. You know, this is how um, a lot of popular image processing applications, Instagram and Snapchat and WhatsApp and Google Photos and everything kind of looks like this. You take a photo and then you can keep on applying a lot of different filters. And you can take a derivative of a filter and apply another filter on top of it and you can keep on working with that. You can make a grayscale and you can make a sepia on that and then you can change the brightness and contrast. At any time you can go back and come back and all of that. How does it work behind the scenes? That's the same concept we're going to use for raster functions. At no point in time the data is actually written to disk. It just keeps a memory of what all transformations you apply on the pixels and it is just rendered on the fly, only on what is displayed on the screen. You could take a, pixel, a picture that's 20 megapixels, it's like numerous number of pixels, 20 MB in size, but your phone can only display so much. And the pixel is always, this image is downsampled only to what is shown on your screen and all this processing is applied just to something what you have on screen. Only when you hit save, it takes about a second or two and then it runs on the entire image and then it's written to disk. Once you have it on disk, you cannot hit back button and go back to your chain of processing. So this is going to be critical to understand for us going forward in this talk. Should you? Yeah. Okay. So some more about raster functions. Right? Raster functions are gonna be the primary information model 
uh, component which processes the, the image data. And its role is to take those input pixels and transform them into a new, new values that uh, represent the process that, that you're applying. So raster functions process a single pixel or block of pixels um, as you zoom around or pan, pan around in ArcGIS Pro or, uh, or in a web map. Um, they can make geometric modifications to the pixels. So right, we have raster functions that do things like orthorectification and projection. Um, but I think you probably know them better for, for making radiometric modifications to the pixel values. So performing band math, doing a tasseled cap operation. Raster functions can be chained together to create simple or more advanced processing chains. And we'll get, get more into that today. Uh, and the pixels flow through that chain in a virtual nature, meaning uh, that these pixels are processed on the fly and we're not saving results to disk as we process them. And lastly, I say here, right, your raster functions can be applied to the imagery layer or embedded within a mosaic data set. And so here's kind of a notional diagram of how raster functions and raster function chains work. Right, you'll have a source image, and on top of that source image, uh, or, or you have pixels coming from that source image, on top of that, we apply a raster function, which can then transform your pixels into a new, new values. And then we can add another raster function on top of it and start chaining things, uh, or we can just push those pixels directly to the screen via ArcGIS Pro or a web map or your mobile device. And out of the box, there are a lot of raster functions, right? We have raster functions to do that, that arithmetic, so you have your math functions. We have correction functions for apparent reflectance and ge geometric corrections like orthorectification. Um, we have hydrological functions, so fill, flow accumulation, flow direction. These functions actually can, are, are more suitable for more global processes, right? Because something like a, a flow accumulation is a more global process. And finally, if you don't see a raster function listed here, you can create your own custom algorithm or custom raster function using Python and the Python raster function framework, which I'm gonna try to, to tie together into this talk uh, with one of our presentations. And those Python raster functions, the concept behind that is that you can write custom Python code that then, can tr then turns into a raster function with the same kind of interface you, you see in Pro or ArcMap uh, and give you that uh, user interface and, and easy interaction with the function to apply that to individual images or a mosaic data set. So here I just show how uh, I have a seasonal ARIMA function and, and I have some parameters defined that are gonna be the input parameters and that turns into my raster function. And I'll touch more on that later. So working with imagery with the ArcGIS API for Python, there are, are four modules. We have the imagery layer, the raster catalog item, raster manager, and imagery tile manager. In terms of sub-modules, I think this is where it's, it's starting to get really interesting um, because as, as we've as you've seen Python grow across the platform, we've incorporated modules like analytics, which can allow you to drive raster analytics through the Python API. Uh, we also have the, the ortho mapping module, which allows you to drive ortho mapping through the ArcGIS API, API for Python too. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about delayed and distributed processing. One of the advantages of using raster functions, as we discussed earlier, is that you can chain these processings together. And as we spoke, you, only the pixels that are displayed on the screen is actually processed. But then when you want to apply that over your entire massive collection of imagery, then you could do that using the image server, but it takes this function chain that you, do, that you define, and then it goes and works on it in a distributed manner. So let's take a look at it a little bit in detail. To do that, what it does, it, it processes only on, when you display it on your screen, when you're working with it, doing a trial and error, describing things going back and forth, it does only on the pixels that are displayed on the screen. Nothing is written to disk yet. But then it keeps a history of what all it did. There are some parallels to this. You know, have you heard of Spark and Dask? Apache Spark? You might have heard about that. Yeah, these are names you come across when you deal with big data sets. These are frameworks that are defined by, uh, Spark is by Apache, Dask is by a, an open source group uh, working, on, working on Python. 
And what they do is they have something called a task graphs. Uh, in Dask, this is what it appears, and Spark, the equivalent you see on the other side. Um, this is how they chain all these different transformations you apply on really large data sets. And only the data set that you want to view, visualize at any point in time is acted upon. And then when you want to persist that, it just goes out and forms out to all the uh, worker nodes and then it applies it on that. So we're trying to do the same kind of thing with the raster functions here. So this is how a sample raster function would look like, the task graph for a raster function would look like. And so we can, we can process rasters at scale using our raster analytics pr um, platform. And right, the idea behind raster analytics is that you can take these raster functions that you might be used to running in ArcGIS Pro or in ArcMap um, and running those on, on small, small areas um, and you can use those raster functions or, or take those raster functions and process really large areas uh, across as many nodes, compute nodes that you have in Amazon or Azure and start doing big data analysis on your raster data. And so you can run models against massive collections of imagery. And the models, are, because of raster analytics, you can really decrease the amount of processing time it takes to apply those raster functions. Um, and so processing that might have taken you days or weeks or even months comes down to hours or minutes when you, can, when you have the ability to distribute your raster processing across your raster analytic nodes. And raster analytics can be driven via several interfaces. So you can execute raster analytics processes through ArcGIS Pro similar to how you apply raster functions in ArcGIS Pro. You can execute raster analytics processes through the web through ArcGIS Online. And you can also use the ArcGIS API for Python to run raster analytics now. And the benefit to that is that you can start to automate processes uh, that go into running raster analytics. So with that, let's get into a few demos. So the first demo I want to show is working with Landsat thematic mapper imagery. Now on our samples page, we have this really cool Jupyter dashboard example for how to build a change detection dashboard using the ArcGIS API for Python and Jupyter dashboards. And the idea here is that we can go in, we use the slider to select two images, zoom to the location and click detect changes and then get a change detection image, which is essentially doing that, that raster math to, to point out areas where pixel values don't line up. Now, this is really cool, but with the Landsat uh, thematic mapper data, that goes all the way back to the early 80s. So there's almost 30 years of Landsat thematic mapper imagery. The question I want to ask is, right, without looking at your imagery, how can you identify whether change has occurred over an area? And so I want to ask, how does land change manifest itself in time series of multispectral imagery? And can you identify when a significance disturbance occurred based on just that temporal spectrum of your, your data? And to do that, we're gonna explore Landsat thematic data, thematic mapper data over a period of about 30 years. And so I wanted to go back and look at my house because I know about 20 years ago, my house was all farmland and I wanted to see if I could use the 30 years of Landsat TM data to identify when development occurred. So right, let's get started. In order to do this, I'm gonna use the spatial data frame because I wanna look at the records, uh, acquisition dates, file names that are associated with my image service. I'm gonna use the functions because I'm gonna use things like stretch and extract bands. Uh, the imagery layer in order to work with my image services some geometry objects that I'm gonna use for querying my image service, and the GIS, um, which is gonna allow me to, to, to connect to my portal. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna log into the portal that hosts my data. That portal has two services that I'm interested in. The first is a thematic mapper multispectral service, which has eight bands, seven spectral bands, and an eighth band that is the QA band, which represents some flag as to whether that pixel uh, corresponds to snow or ice or grass. Um, and then the second service is an NDVI service, which is two bands, 
one being the NDVI and the second being the QA, QA band. So here are my two services. I'm gonna define the imagery layers so I can connect to them. And so how does land change manifest itself in the multispectral imagery? To investigate, let's go to O'Fallon, Missouri. Right, so I live in a suburb that's about 25 miles northwest of St. Louis and it's sprawling suburbs, but 30 years ago it wasn't this way. So about, um, so if you look at the map, that red dot represents uh, where the location of my house. So how many Landsat TM rasters were collected over O'Fallon, Missouri? I can find that out by querying, uh, querying the image service and getting back a data frame. And I can use a spatial filter to define the location I wanna query over. So here I've defined the geometry or the location I'm interested in. I've defined a uh, intersection filter that I'm going to apply when I query my, my uh, image service. And when I do that, I see that there's 563 Landsat TM images over that location. So what does the data frame look like? The data frame looks essentially like the attribute table of my image service. So I can see there's acquisition dates, there's the cloud cover flag, um, um, and a lot more information here. So how do I interpret the acquisition date? I actually need to do some conversion and I'm gonna create a new field in my, my data frame called date uh, and convert that acquisition date from the value into a, a date time object. So I can do that here. I'm interested in cloud free images. So how do I find the cloud free images? I filter the data frame for cloud cover values that are less than uh, 10%. And after doing that, I found some. So I found one image from 1982 and one from 2010, and I've selected them by filtering my layer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a map of 1982 and a map of 2010 over O'Fallon, Missouri. Now I've created those map objects and I'm gonna put them side by side using this, this H box or horizontal box so that you can see how much has changed over the course of that 28 years. So right on your right is going to be the image from 1982 and on your left is gonna be the image from 2010. And you can see that, right, a lot, of, a lot of suburbs have popped up or a lot of developments have popped up and in particular, over the red dot, which still represents my house, um, there, was, there was no development before. And actually, you know, there was development kind of close by, but, but didn't get into that area. So right, looking at these two images, we can tell a lot has changed, but how do we use this to identify when this change happened? And so, before I get into that, I added those layers to my map by just calling add layer and I've chained together a stretch function on top of an extract band function. So the extract band function orders the bands two, one, and zero, so those are the bands that I see, um, and the stretch is applying a standard deviation stretch with a dynamic range adjustment for both. And I also changed the zoom and, and drew the geometry on my map. So I'm gonna use NDVI to pinpoint when my home was built. NDVI stands for Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and for Landsat TM, NDVI equals the near infrared band four minus the visual band three divided by near infrared plus visual. And for NDVI, the result's always gonna be between negative one and one. So NDVI typically looks something like this, right? So if you go to our, our Landsat 8 views service in ArcGIS Online, and you apply the NDVI color uh, function to it, this is what you're gonna get. And so we're looking at the same area that I've been focusing on, uh, and what you see is, you know, NDVI highlights where healthy vegetation is gonna be in this darker green, but then also where maybe impervious surfaces are gonna be in this orangish, peachish color. And so this is what you typically see when you, you look at an NDVI image. Now, I'm just applying that NDVI using the function that's embedded in that Landsat views service. And so if I look at the properties and the raster functions embedded in that Landsat layer, you can see that there's 
a bunch of them, right? There's agriculture with dynamic range adjustment, bathymetric with dynamic range adjustment, color infrared. And when they're embedded in the, the image service, you can just call apply and apply that raster function to, uh, to your view based on the name of the raster function. So how do I get pixel values over, uh, over time at a given location? What I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use the identify function and run an identify at the location of my house over every, um, over every time step in my image service. And so what are the NDVI pixel values? So I, I'm just gonna show you the first five here. Uh, I mentioned that the NDVI service has two bands, the first being the actual NDVI value and the second being the QA value. So here we have the, the first five uh, NDVI values with the first, with their corresponding QA values. So just a little bit more on the Landsat QA band. The QA band represents uh, kind of a, a classification of what they think that pixel might be. And it's really helpful for filtering out areas that are snow covered or ice covered uh, or cloud covered. And so on the left here, you see that uh, we have the QA band that's probably highlighting the snow that's in the mountains in the, uh, the actual multispectral image here. So what does the NDVI curve look like after I've queried out all those pixel values? I'll show you this first without filtering anything, uh, and I'm gonna plot everything using matplotlib and Seaborn, using the Seaborn dark grid style. And when I do that, uh, you just kind of see a whole mess of pixels here. But what's interesting is, is you see that something changed, right? The, the range in pixel values for the NDVI was greater prior to 1997, maybe even 1996. And then after that, that range became narrower. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna filter out values based on QA band values. So I can use the QA band to filter out snow, ice, and clouds. And I can apply that here just using, uh, using this loop and defining the pixel values that I wanna keep. So here are pixel values that correspond to things that uh, I don't want to filter out. And I want to get only clear pixels, so I've established a clear pixel array and clear time array. And after I do that, what does that curve look like? So again, you know, the, the kind of trend that we saw of a uh, larger range in pixel values up until about 1997, that pops out, but now you kind of see a, a seasonality to some of the pixel values. So if you look at like the, the 1989 and 1993, you have lower NDVI values on the actual day or on the actual year, so in January, and they kind of come up in the summer. So you see kind of a, an oscillatory pattern to your NDVI values which correspond to the seasons. But then sometime around 1996, that all changed. And so not only did you see uh, a change in the pattern, you almost see no pattern here, right? Like there's no seasonality to your NDVI values from 1996 through 1997. And then that slowly comes back up to, a, to kind of a smaller dynamic range. So right, based on this, I can kind of estimate that, hey, my house was probably built between 1996 and, and 1997, right? We see the, those higher max NDVI values until 1996, and that range becomes smaller uh, onward from 1997. And right, so to wrap this up, let's look at some images from 1996 and 1997. Right, I went through that same process of filtering uh, images based on cloud cover and date and for 1996 and 1997, um, on the right here, you have your image from 1996, and on the left, 1997. So, you know, this, these neighborhoods here look like they were probably just getting started in 1996. And then what's interesting is they, they, maybe it's just the stretch, it's, it's hard to tell, but they start to take some shape in 1997, but also you see other developments popping up all around them, some to the west, some to the south. So right, there's, there's some other things we could ask, some other questions we could ask, like, you know, how is this occurring across the country, or does this apply to other scenarios? Um, or how do you implement this as an algorithm that can be run nationally or globally? Um, 
but those are questions for another day. So uh, with that, I'll turn it turn it back over. I really like the demo. The other day, if you recall, you and I were talking. The one of the beauty of that algorithm is that it doesn't really apply classification on imagery. Mm. It applies a simple logic, but then you can just apply that on a temporal scale and then understand how land use changed over time. It's something that's simple that can be reproduced across the globe to answer some of the questions that you put forth. Like, on a global scale, how much is vegetation cover reducing? Where does it reduce? Where does it increase? Uh, where is um, urban, uh, urban sprawl happening? And such kind of questions. It's really, it's really interesting questions that you can be answered with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, without applying any real complex processing, you can really extract a lot of information just from the pixels that come with your data. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I've seen NDVI being applied in a lot of vegetation ag tech, but this is, an, this is a kind of uh, perspective that I have not seen before. I really like that. Uh, so Greg showed us, was it Landsat? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was Landsat data set, and Landsat has been collecting imagery uh, for a really long period of time. The aspect about Landsat is that it collects data, and it used to collect in fewer bands, like eight bands, and then that uh, used to be older um, spacecrafts that Lance, uh, USGS had. And nowadays, Landsat 8 collects in around 13 bands, I guess. Yeah. So we call that as multispectral data set because it collects in red, green, and blue, as well as a few other bands. But now let's scale it up even more and talk about what if you collect data in hundreds of different bands. And I, that's what I call it as high dimensionality images. These are called as hyperspectral images. How many of you have come across that term? This is the best dev summit ever. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. If you were to visualize a hyperspectral image, it's properly represented as a cube. Um, you have red, green, and blue at the top. And then you have multiple different channels that you collect, multiple different wavelengths that are stacked one behind the other and represented in, in, in a cube like this. And because there are hundreds of different bands, it becomes more than three-dimensional. It becomes multi-dimensional at that point. So I'm going to use data from a sensor called Avris. It's an airborne platform. I'm reading that. I publish that as an image layer. I'm reading it back into my Python API as an item. And a little bit about Avris. So it's an airborne platform, airborne, so it uses one of these high altitude aircrafts like U2. And this is how the sensor looks like. It's a pretty massive one. Um, all the optics, the cooling technology, the filtering, uh, not the filtering, the calibration, everything is housed into this. And then it is put on this aircraft and then collects data into a long strip like this. And you can download it for free from USGS and that's what I did. And I published it onto my imagery layer. Now let's inspect this imagery layer and try to get some information about the number of bands that is, that is there. So you could do something like key properties and get the band properties, and you notice that there are 224 different bands. And then you can ask a question about, okay, there are 200 bands, tell me what the wavelengths are. Now because this is Python and Pandas is integrated, you can read this information that you got back in this variable as a Pandas data frame. And now I'm plotting as, oops, it's too tiny over there. Well, if I zoom it up, the rest of my widgets get out of whack, so I'm trying to stick to that. Um, so it, it ranges all the way from blue, 365 nanometers, and then if, I, if you were to plot the end of it, it goes up to 2,500 nanometers, well into the middle infrared region. Now, because you have so many different bands, you can do something called collecting spectral signatures from each of the different pixels. And before I explain what it is, let's see how it looks like. Now, I just created a false color composite for the imagery layer and threw it on my map widget. And then I can click on a particular pixel. Let's say this is densely vegetated farmland. I can click on that, and I would get a curve. What's happening is it, I'm writing, I can show you the code next. I'm clicking on a pixel, I'm collecting the data for that pixel in all the 224 bands, getting into an array, and using C, uh, bokeh in this case to plot it as a curve. And you see this, there's, uh, this is the blue and the green wavelengths, not much of re reflected energy, and then there's a sudden upshoot, there's a 
sudden increase in the amount of reflected energy, and then the reflectance curve kind of tapers off. And then you can click on some other area, like this is a barren land, I guess. You can click on that and collect spectral signature for that particular pixel. And you can zoom in a little bit more, and then we'll collect for, uh, that's not even an imagery there. Let's zoom a little bit more and collect for the water body. If you notice, uh, when I clicked on B, which is this barren land, there was not much of a signal, but it was some, some amount of soil reflectance was present. When I clicked on the water stream over here, uh, there was absolutely no signal from when you cross the near infrared region because water is almost a black body in remote sensing speak and absorbs all the energy. It doesn't really reflect back anything back to the sensor. And if you recall, in Greg's demo, he showed you the equation for NDVI. It was near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red. Why did we choose those two wavelengths? The answer is in this blue curve. You see the sudden signal difference between near infrared and the red region? This is called the red edge in remote sensing. That's when you have really strong vegetation. It reflects a lot in the near infrared and absorbs completely in the red. But then when you have aging and uh, you know, vegetation that has um, infection and, 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 uh, and older leaves that are going into the uh, fall colors, this red edge becomes weaker and weaker and it becomes flat lines. So you can just use those two different band, those two bands and find a difference between them and you normalize and then you get this vegetation index that can tell you definitely this is a vegetated pixel. It's a strong healthy vegetation. This is probably soil or it's going to be old vegetation. So that's the reason why we have that equation in NDVR. If you want to know how I did this, this is how I did it. So I used, I went ahead and defined a set of different symbols for different alphabets like A, B, C, and D. That's what happens when I click on a map. And then I define something called a callback. So whenever I click on a map, uh, the widget knows that somebody clicked on it. And then it, I define a Python function that has to be invoked every time I click on it. That particular Python function is this, plot the reflectance curve. And then it uses bokeh behind the scenes. And it uses something called get samples. So when I click on a pixel, it calls get sample to get the actual pixel value in all the different bands. And then it does a little bit of number processing and then puts it onto a curve under this. So for the rest of this talk, we are going to use these three different spectral signature, and we're going to see how we can use this information to classify this image uh, into, and finding other pixels that are similar to these. So what we are going to do is calculating the spectral angles. So this is an equation, it's called spectral angle mapper. What it does is it finds similarity between the spectral signature curves. So it goes to every single pixel and it finds, is this spectral signature, is this curve similar to the curve that I was given, like the reference curve. And this is the equation that simplifies that entire curve into one value called the alpha value, ranges from zero to one. Zero being the curves are pretty similar one being the curves are very far away from one another. We'll just use a simple metric to try and classify each of the different pixel and find out which of the three different classes a pixel would fall. And if I were to do this using NumPy, just on, not on a pixel, but just on a single value, this is how I would define the function. I can plot the three different spectral signatures. I can calculate the angle between A and B and then it gives me back a value of 0.6. It doesn't mean much. It always means in relative to something else what this number is. And I can calculate between B and C as 0.62. A and C were very different. If you recall, A was vegetation, C was water. That has a really high value of 0.9, close to one, meaning they're really farther apart. And for just for the heck of it, we'll try to see what's the difference between A and A, and they're going to be not a number, sometimes I get zero, zero as a result back because A is very similar to A, there's no point in comparing. Now, the challenge for us today is to codify that particular raster function, the equation that you see, as a raster function. And so, I spent an awful lot of time <laughs> trying to write this. I'm kidding, it's actually pretty simple once you kind of understand this. So, this is how the raster function looks like. Um, I can skip over to this side and show you the function looks like. 
Um, so I divide it into different parts. I compute what the numerator is, I compute what the components and the denominator is, and I finally divide. So I use things like band arithmetic, square root, times, divide, and I do things like stretching, applying a color map, and so on, to display the, raster, uh, the, the, com the computer raster image. All of this is going to be available on GitHub, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time into this one. Let's proceed and see how we can use this. And then once I compute, once I write the raster function, I can spend, I can give it a reference spectra. In this case, it was uh, the first point that we clicked at, which was uh, the image, the, the vegetated pixel. I can give it the imagery layer that it has to work on, which is our Avery's image layer. And then I can display a map and try to render the results of it back on the map. Um, because the values are going to range from zero and one, uh, we need to stretch it, apply a color map to it so it can be rendered in a way that we can visualize and see in a grayscale how it looks like. Um, it's a pretty complex chain that we are applying because we are working on 224 bands and we are doing a square root and whatnot. Uh, so it takes a few seconds for that to apply. But all of this is on the fly, so we can click on, we can zoom to any area of interest and see what the results are. Uh, so remember, we clicked on a farmland. So everything that appears bright white is farm area. And we realized that vegetated pixel farmland is very spectrally different from water body. So this is a stream that appears jet black on our screen. So what, did, what we just did right now is we took an image classification algorithm and we defined it simply using raster functions. That just shows you uh, the power that you get with raster functions. But you get even more power when you use Python raster function, and for that, you got to wait for the next demo from, from Greg. Okay. Now, you can do something like this. You can ask the imagery layer to draw a graph, and we can visualize what the chain of uh, raster functions that has been applied to this. You can see there's band arithmetic. Um, all those mathematical operators are represented as local. Um, we'll try to do an announcement and try to represent this more accurately, saying divide or plus or minus in the next release, probably. And finally, I did a stretch and I threw it on the map widget. Now, we could try to do this a little bit more by trying to classify by all the three different spectra that we collected on the map in the beginning. And when I did this, I did this before we did the talk, and this is how the uh, output looks like. The first one is for uh, the vegetated pixels. You see the farmlands here are looking bright white in color, and then it looks pretty dark in the next one because the next one represents uh, empty land, barren land, fallow land. And these are the pixels that are brighter in the second image, and they are dark in the first image. The third one represents water body, so the stream looks pretty bright white in this. So that's where I conclude this demo. It's just a sneak peek into defining and working with multidimensional or yeah, multidimensional data sets using raster functions. Cool. And I'm gonna pick up on that and go back to working with uh, multidimensional scientific data. So He's shown how you work with hyperspectral data. I'm gonna get back uh, to working with that spatial and temporal aspect uh, of the data, and specifically a scientific data set. Now, really, my motivation for, for this presentation was uh, I do a lot of this, uh, some Python raster function development, and I, wanna kind of, I wanted to try to, to bridge the gap between, hey, here's what you do in the ArcGIS API for Python, and Here's how uh, an Esri uh, Python raster function works. So I wanted to use this data exploration as kind of motivation to write a new Python raster function. Um, so I'm gonna try to tie everything together to tie everything back to that uh, a Python raster function in the end. So the data set that I'm gonna look at uh, is the DayMet daily climatological, uh, daily surface weather and climatological summaries uh, provided by Oak Ridge National Lab here. Here's the web page. If you go onto the web page, you'll see they provide really rich um, 
scientific data sets. The one I'm going to focus on is the monthly climate summaries on a one kilometer grid for North America. Now these are going to be net CDF files uh, and each net CDF file, uh, so there's going to be 38 net CDF files. Each corresponds to a year, but within each year there's 12 months of daytime, average daytime maximum temperature. So a lot of data uh, and I've put that all into a single image service. So for more information on the Daymet temperature data, here are some two, reference, two references to Thornton. Um, but the questions I want to answer are, can we visualize seasonal temperature change over time? Uh, how do we extract the seasonal temperature values from the image service? And then can we model seasonal temperature change and can we predict future, season, future seasonal temperatures? So for this I'm going to use again the data frame, imagery layer, uh, and geometry for querying and first thing I'm going to do is log into my portal and connect uh, to my image service, the average monthly maximum temperature image service here. So the average daytime temperature for, Jan uh, for January of 1980 over North America looks like this, right? So you can see obviously there's going to be warmer temperatures in, in Mexico and the southern US and cooler temperatures as you get go north in North America. What I do here is I'm, I'm filtering, uh, creating a where clause where I can filter on the name of the image but within the data set every NC4 file or NetCDF file has 12 indices. So you can see I'm highlighting index 0. Index 0 corresponds to January, index 1 to February, index 2 to, to March and so on. And so I can kind of filter out or, or uh, export out that image by filtering by name. Right, I can do that for every image here and so I set up a loop to, to generate this, this raster for each month from 1980. And what I get is a raster for January, February, and it'll become more obvious. You'll start to see the, the you know, the North America temperature change. Uh, seasonal temperature change more obviously as I, I get to April and May and June and so on. So right, temperature, it's kind of intuitive here, temperature goes up in the summer and it comes down in the winter. So we'll start seeing the temperatures decrease as we go into October. So I'm interested in looking at uh, how those temperatures have changed over time and eventually getting to the point where I can possibly make a prediction as to whether I think there's a trend behind the scenes that shows that temperatures in St. Louis are going to increase over the next 10, 15 years or they're going to decrease over the next 10 or 15 years. So I'm going to, I've defined an area around the St. Louis arch here. Uh, I'm using a point geometry. Now for the queries I'm going to do I need to specify a time uh, and this time corresponds to uh, January of 1980. So at a single pixel at a single time I can use an identify and pass that geometry and that time extent and get the pixel value back. And when you do that, that pixel object has encoded into it the value of the pixel, so this would be 4 degrees Celsius, but also the metadata associated with the raster it's extracting that pixel from. So the value for that pixel uh, corresponds to the temperature and that's going to be 4.17 degrees. I can export that table, uh, I can export the image service table to a data frame by querying the image service and getting back the data frame. Here I show the first three uh, items in the data frame and you can see what some of the attributes we're storing with that image service are. Now let's look or let's get the temperatures over St. Louis at every time step. So I'm going to go through and identify at that location over each time extent. And when I do that I get back for each, each month a pixel value or a temperature. So for uh, January 16th of 1981 I get 4.7 degrees, February 9, uh, March 14 and so on. Now I want, what's that? Is that in Celsius? In Celsius, yes. Okay. Yep, yep. And um, right. And so I, I wanted to sort those values too because um, 
when you identify on the image, they don't just come out necessarily in, in temporal order from oldest to newest. So I wanted to make sure to sort them so, so when I connect the dots in my plot, everything looked nice. Um, right, so at the end I have basically a sorted array of temperatures and a sorted array of date times. So here's my sorted date times array. And then when I plot, I can plot the periodic curve or, or that, that temperature curve. And for this I'm gonna use, again, Seaborn and Matplotlib, but I'm gonna use the 538 theme in, in Seaborn. And so when I plot temperature uh, versus time, you see, you know, a very clear seasonal trend here, right? Um, and what's kind of interesting to me is it's, from, from the eye, it, it's hard to pull out whether there's any kind of trend upward in temperature over time or downward. Um, but it does seem like, you know, there might be some more extreme cold temperatures closer to, you know, the 80s and the 90s than there have been recently. But really, just looking at it, I find it difficult for, for me to pull out some kind of trend in the data. In order to do that, I'm going to try to model the temperature change over time and really ask two questions, right? Can we model the change over time with Python? And can we predict future seasonal temperature values um, from that model? So in order to do this, I'm gonna use pandas uh, to really structure the, the data and stats models to predict out future temperature values. So I import pandas as PD and stats models.api as SM. And I create a data frame of the temperatures. And in that data frame, it's gonna be the date and the values. And I'm gonna set the date to be the actual index. So unfortunately, this is a little bit small, but here's what my data frame ends up looking like with date being the, the index field. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply a seasonal decomposition to my temperature values um, using the seasonal decompose uh, function in the stats model uh, library. And what that's gonna do is it's automatically gonna decompose the time series into different components. So when I run that, it generates a plot for me that shows the observed temperature values on top. It extracts some underlying trend and then it shows you that seasonal component, which is the, you know, the up and down of the temperatures um, over the months. It also shows the residual, which is gonna be the observed minus seasonal plus trend. Like, truth be told, I'm not 100% sure yet how they get this trend value. So, um, so I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and, uh, and give more definition to how I extract that trend value. And to do that, I used um, a similar function. I use the autoregressive integrated moving average function within the stats models API. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow me to define the fit parameters uh, that are gonna give me a model for the seasonality of the temperatures and whether there's some kind of underlying trend. Um, and if you wanna learn more about this, I just go to the, the, the documentation which we'll, we'll share with you after this. So the concept that I wanted to look at is I wanted to use 26 or the first 26 years of the temperature data to train my model and then I wanted to test against the most recent 10 and see what happened. So I've divided my data frame up into a training set and a test set. I'm going to use, this, use a, a library called Pyramid which is really a wrapper around the stats model ARIMA function. Uh, and, and allows you to um, run kind of an iterative ARIMA on, on your data in order to extract some kind of trend. And so I import ARIMA, or auto ARIMA from Pyramid here, and I define my model using my, my data frame. And then I fit my model to the training data, so right, I can call fit, and then I predict. And the way it works here is that I'm I'm looking at monthly data, so it asks me to predict out how many months I'm interested in. And so I'm interested in 120 months, and then I concatenate the data frames for easy plotting, so I just use pandas to concatenate my data frames. And in the end, I've trained my data, or trained my model against these first 26 years, and I'm trying to predict what the temperatures should have been based on that model in orange. So again, 
the actual temperature data is in blue, and my prediction is in orange. And when I show that, you can see that there's a slight upward trend in the peak values of my, uh, of my temperatures in orange. So, you know, my prediction based on the model parameters that I used are yielding some kind of uh, increase in temperature over time. And to dive a little bit deeper, we can see by looking into the data frame that uh, for predicted data that over the course of about 10 years, our prediction for what the monthly or what the, the daytime maximum temperature should be for July goes from about 32.48 degrees Celsius to 33.48. So a one degree Celsius increase over time. Right, so, so having done this on one location, I wanted to ask is there a trend at other locations? So I defined eight cities, LA, San Francisco, Chicago, Houston, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Boston, and St. Louis. Um, I added them to the map, added them to a map just to show you what I'm looking at here. So to add them to the map, I've defined a symbology and I'm gonna instantiate a map and add those locations to it. Right, so I'm interested in the uh, temperature over time over these eight locations. So I ran this analysis for each city uh, and in the end what I got was I have one concatenated data frame that shows the date and the temperatures for each city over time as a single data frame. I can plot those temperature profiles per city directly from that data frame, right? And one of the things I wanted to do through this too is uh, figure out how to use Seaborn to make some really nice comparative plots here. Um, so if I plot Los Angeles and San Francisco side by side, you see, you know, they, they obviously have uh, different temperature ranges. Right. Similarly, you know, here's Chicago and Houston. Uh, Houston has a much more narrow uh, variation in seasonal temperatures than Chicago. And Philly and Atlanta. And then St. Louis and Boston. Right, and having written all this code to, to use the um, autoregressive integrated moving average, I wanted to apply that to all the cities and see what it yielded. And I thought it was really interesting because, you know, for St. Louis it shows if I train over the first 26 years and then predict over the most recent 10, I have an upward trend in, in the, or I predict an upward trend in the temperatures. Whereas for Los Angeles and San Francisco it actually shows the opposite. And, you know, when you look at some of the temperature profiles for LA and San Francisco, you see some really hot summers uh, from the 80s and the 90s. And so perhaps that's biasing it or, 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 um, or really forcing it into predicting future temperature decreases. Right, then there are some locations like Houston which, you, you know, the model predicted an, an upward trend in those temperatures over time. And then Chicago where it was really hard to tell um, whether there was gonna be an increase or a decrease in temperature. So right, here's Atlanta and Philadelphia. And here's Boston and St. Louis. And right, so this is for specific locations. I wanted to use this notebook as a way to prototype a raster function. Um, so if we want to efficiently do this analysis across the entire North America data set, we need to create what's called a Python raster function from it. And so um, if you go to Esri raster functions, so github.com slash Esri slash raster functions, you can see all the different Python raster functions Esri has out there for, for users as samples or, or for, for use. And in it, I've checked in a seasonal Arima raster function, which should mimic, mimics the workflow that I did in this notebook, uh, but really puts it into a raster function so that you can apply it on a mosaic data set or an image service and run this analysis across, um, across the entire data set rather than at, at individual locations. And so just a little bit of information, right, you know, I, I have, I've named it seasonal arima. My input parameters are gonna be uh, the data start year, a prediction month, right, I wanna baseline my predictions and look at January versus January uh, rather than trying to compare January of 2010 to, you know, July of 2020. Um, 
I have a prediction year, um, training start year, and training end year. And then these P, D, Q, and S are going to be fit parameters for the ARIMA model. Now, all of the analytical work in the raster function is done in the update pixels block here. And really, I've, I've used this notebook to prototype the use of uh, stats models, uh, prediction and, and fitting as a raster function. So if you look in, in the actual update pixels block, you'll see, you know, I'm using um, uh, stats models SRIMA X in order to do the fitting and the modeling. Now, in pro, what that ends up looking like is I can, I can go and insert a Python raster function. So I've already brought this raster function in as seasonal arima. I've created the raster function in this project. So when I go to it, I see that, you know, I have my, my nice parameters that I'm used to when I work with raster functions. Um, and I've embedded this raster function into the actual mosaic. So when I go to the properties of my mosaic, so when I go to the properties of the mosaic layer, I can see in my processing templates, I have that raster function embedded in it. And now when I run this processing template or I apply that, I get spatial predictions as to what those temperature changes should look like at a per pixel level. So each pixel represents a one kilometer area. And over Houston, um, you see that, you know, over the period of my modeling parameters, we're gonna be, my prediction year is gonna be 2050. Between now and 2050, we expect like a 1.3 degree increase in Celsius in temperature over the pixel I selected. But on the other end of the city, you do expect a, a higher increase. So it really allows you to get, you know, apply this analysis to every pixel in your data set. I want to contrast that though to San Francisco, which, you know, the model in the notebook said or showed that there was a, a decrease or predicted a decrease over time. And similarly here, you know, you see the spatial nature of what, what those decreases might look like. So I know that's a little bit fast uh, and there's really a, a lot to unpack in, in the Python raster function, some of the analysis but I wanted to kind of give you an idea of how I've used um, image services and the Python API to, to motivate or, or prototype out a, a Python raster function. So, yeah. Yeah, so this actually, um, I think we should probably conclude it. Probably, yeah. Yeah, so this <laughs> concludes our talk today. Uh, and we'll open up for questions. Do you, do you want to discuss about something? Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah, I, I wanted to use this more as a, as a methods talk, like, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you repeat that? Because the actual processing takes a minute or two, even though it's on the fly, processing through some of these uh, fitting algorithms takes a lot of time. So I've already pre-clipped out or pre-processed these areas so that I could just show them rather than um, waiting for the mosaic to render the pixels. Or there's a, a trade-off that's made, right? The raster functions can be very powerful, but when you start to do um, more complicated analysis, it, it takes time. And that's where we wanted to try to motivate this, the raster analytics, the use of raster analytics to take something that's more complicated that really takes, you know, it took maybe two minutes to generate this little area. Now, if you want to scale that up, you're going to need, you're going to need several compute machines and yes. you're going to need something like raster analytics to scale out that, scale up that analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually a good topic to say, this is a point probably where you would move from a workstation processing yeah. into a server or a server farm where you have multiple different computers 
uh, machines that are just attached to your image server, uh, raster analysis server and farm it out there. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. It's a good question. Um, and are you suggesting to try to parse out or... Not, so I would say no because I think the, the raster function framework is the right place to stay within. And I would try to write the raster functions and... Um, and, and, and stay within Pro. I'm not sure, I haven't really thought, thought beyond, like if you don't have raster analytics, but you wanna do big data, I, don't, I haven't really thought through what the, the, best, the best way to do that is yet, sorry. One way you can probably think through that is, do you wanna visualize on the fly when you right. have really large data, or do you wanna schedule it, run it overnight, come back and look at it the next day? So if you wanna do it on the fly, then uh, these are some of the limits that we are working with, just Hardware limits. Okay, if there's no other. Oh, yep. Uh, what's your, um, Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, please fill out your surveys. Tell us oh, yeah. what you think about this talk and uh, if it. Yeah, there's one. Yes, we will put it on this particular repo. Oh. Flip that to three. Yes. Yeah. There's a. Python API repo. Um, the screen, I think, is covering off, flipping off your URL. Okay, no, oh, it, yeah. it just shows up. Yeah, <laughs> that's our that's our repo. If you go to their talks, um, we have talks from all the previous conferences. We'll create one for Dev Summit and 2019 and put it there. Yes. Not just the two of us, the rest of the Python API team and everyone else who use Python API. We ask them to share their notebooks, their slide deck as a PDF, and put it up there. 